Hi, this is Amber Barnato. I'm Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh. And Mary Beth Happ and I are co-principal investigators on a randomized trial called the SPEAKS-2 study. We are conducting a step wedge cluster randomized trial, and Heather Kelly asked me to tell you all a little bit about what that means. So first, to remind you of what our trial involves is it's a nurse training intervention. It's a web-based training module that nurses are assigned to take online, followed up by a post-test questionnaire to evaluate what they've learned. In addition to receiving training on every intensive care unit uh, where the nurses have been trained, a cart of communication supplies is made available. Additionally, uh, there's a speech-language pathologist bedside consult. Uh, we call it speech-language pathology rounds, where a particularly interesting case of a patient who is mechanically ventilated with difficulty communicating is used as an example, and nurses discuss with the speech-language pathologist at the patient's bedside techniques that can be used to improve the effectiveness of communication between the nurse and the patient. So this is a slide of our design. The first thing to know is that we had initially planned a traditional cluster randomized design. I'll tell you a little bit more about the distinctions between parallel cluster randomized designs and crossover trials. And we were planning on randomizing three units to the intervention and having three units as controls. And one of the members of the inquiry advisory committee expressed concerns to us that because there might be a lot of heterogeneity in the patient populations between the intervention and the control units, it might be impossible to tell the effect of our intervention. So we uh, decided instead to use a step wedge cluster randomized trial in these six units. And this figure shows um, a table with the rows are the individual six units and the columns are time, measured by quarters. The quarter of intervention for each of the six units was assigned randomly. What this shows is that in the first quarter, or what's known as time point zero, all six units were observed. Unit number one, uh, which is sort of an arbitrary number reflecting the assignment of intervention, that was the unit that was assigned to receive the intervention first, went live with the nurse training intervention, availability of communication cart supplies, and speech language pathology um, bedside rounds in the second quarter. That's the red X. And during that same quarter, all of the other units were still in their control condition. This continued every quarter so that by quarter seven, all six units had started the intervention. So let me back up and give you a little bit of a primer, which is the purpose of this webinar. So what is a, class, a cluster randomized trial? So the word cluster means like a group of things together, like a peanut cluster where you have peanut covered with chocolate all smushed together, which are like my favorite treats. Uh, randomization is at the group level, although inference is at the individual level. Now it's useful when individual randomization is not feasible, and this is most typically in the situation of contamination. So for example, in our study, it would have been impossible to randomize by patient. Imagine, for example, that each, subsequent, uh, each sequential patient had been randomized to having the nurse use the communication skills that she had learned or not use them. Well, that doesn't make much sense. She can't unlearn the things that she's been taught. Uh, and if the communication cart were handy, she might not be able to resist to use her new skills, even if the patient had been randomized to not use the communication tools. Now, what if we had tried instead to uh, randomly assign nurses the intervention so that half the nurses were trained and half weren't? Well, again, that doesn't make much sense given 
most common staffing models in ICUs where nurses aren't necessarily only assigned to one patient throughout the entire patient's stay. That patient might have been touched by an intervention and non-intervention, or rather a trained and untrained nurse. So in our case, cluster randomization was really the only possible way to achieve our aims without having contamination. Now the weakness of this kind of a design is that it's less efficient than an individual level randomization. It typically requires larger sample sizes. The key statistical concern is that there are multiple sources of variation because individual units, in our case intensive care units, might vary. For example, imagine trying to compare the outcomes of the neurological intensive care unit and the cardiac intensive care unit. Very different case mix of patients, very different outcomes. It would be hard to disentangle the effect of the case mix from the effect of the intervention if we had used the neurologic uh, intensive care unit as the treatment and the cardiovascular intensive care unit as control, for example. So let me orient you to the different types of cluster randomized trials. Uh, parallel is the simplest. That's just one time point where by the flip of a coin, you assign half of the clusters to the treatment and half to the control. Really simple analysis, it's just a t-test. But it is sensitive to between cluster variation, as I've mentioned. So for example, doing a cluster randomized trial at the level of schools or hospitals or clinics, you would need to have tons and tons of those individual clusters so that you would feel confident that you had a random distribution of types of schools or hospitals or clinics in your treatment arm and in your control arm. So an alternate way of dealing with that is the crossover cluster randomized trial where you use two time points and you cross over. Uh, the crossover time is randomly assigned. Uh, each unit is assigned the treatment period uh, or control first, and then there's a washout, and then they cross over to the alternate. Again, the analysis is simple. It's a paired t-test. And the power is no longer sensitive to between cluster variation because each cluster spends time as the treatment and spends time as control. Now, this might be the, an example of something where the intervention can be turned on and off. In our case, since our intervention involved educating nurses, we couldn't turn it off. Once the nurses had been educated, we can't take away their knowledge. So it's impossible for us to do a two-time point crossover trial, which brings us to the stepped wedge crossover design. This involves multiple time points where the time of crossover is selected in random order. The crossover is always unidirectional, usually because the intervention can't be taken away, and that's an example uh, similar to our trial, the education of nurses. And the uh, crossover is from control to treatment. The analysis is more complex. It has to be model-based. The nice thing about this type of study is that it's uh, not as sensitive to between cluster variation, but delayed treatment effect hurts power. By delayed treatment effect, I mean whether the effect on patient outcomes occurs right after the intervention starts or whether it's delayed some, some time points. So let's go back to the slide describing the SPEAKS2 trial. Again, to orient you, we have rows for each of the ICUs in the study and column for the time points. The unit number is arbitrary related to the order in which the unit was randomized to receive the intervention. In quarter one, all, all of the units are in the observation pre-intervention period, so they are in the control time. Quarter two is when the first unit begins the nurse training intervention, availability of the communication materials on the unit, and the speech-language pathologist bedside rounds. 
Thereafter, Unit 1 always has the intervention on. That is to say, the nurse's education can't be taken away. We, can, we repeatedly refill the communication carts and speech-language pathology uh, consultation is available throughout the time period. So what you see about this particular design is that in this period here, the pre-period for all the units, all of the units are in their control period. After the red X is where intervention goes live, all of the units are in their post or intervention period. There's the same number of observations above the diagonal line as there are below the diagonal line. Each unit has observations in the control period and in the intervention period. That allows each unit to serve as its own control. And by having data collected from each unit throughout the entire time period, you're able to address secular trends. Imagine, for example, that one of our outcomes is, as it is, uh, ventilator-free days. And if there were a, an unexpected outbreak of SARS in the middle of the trial, if we had done the, one of the other trial designs, the, inter, the outbreak of SARS would be perfectly aligned with either the intervention or control, depending on the unit's assignment. But in this case, we have information about the units during the SARS epidemic, as well as before it and after it, which allows us to use statistical modeling to control for secular trends that might be due to things like epidemics. So in conclusion, um, the stepped wedge randomized cluster design is relatively new. It's being used mostly with designs studying, I would say, quality improvement interventions. Typically, the most common rationale for using this kind of a design is that it would be unethical to not let everyone have the intervention because you uh, don't actually have equipoise. You really believe that the treatment is probably effective. And also, because it might be infeasible for all of the clusters to start at the same time, and you have to roll it out. Now, in our case, neither of those things were particularly true. We do have some confidence that it's better than control to have nurses trained in communication, uh, speech, uh, assistive communication techniques for mechanically ventilated patients, but it wouldn't necessarily have been unethical to provide it randomly to some units and not other units. And it would have been feasible to go live all at once. So for us, the rationale was really that we wanted to avoid the problem with between cluster variation, and we wanted to address secular trends. I wanted to acknowledge Jim Hughes. He's a faculty member in the Department of Biostatistics at the University of Washington who has some slides that detail the stepped wedge design at this website, you're welcome to go there and learn a little bit more about the design and the statistical analyses used, as well as information about what increases and decreases the power of these studies. Thanks for the opportunity to present.